So yeah, so I'll get started here. And um, I just thought I would share my journey of how I went from just being bee curious to master beekeeper. And probably like a lot of other uh, folks out there that I never was around bees. I never knew anybody that kept them, but there was something that inside of me that just always thought it would be fun. And um, so, so it was really for me, I can't explain why I was attracted to getting into bees, but I just, uh, you know, some would say it's my calling or my addiction, but I just had to do it. And how it started for me was that there was a, a lecture at a local library and uh, it was like in the, in the free newspaper that you get in your driveway. And I saw that this lecture was going on. And it was funny for me because like I grew up um, outside of St. Louis and, um, you know, which is a lot more uh, farmland and rural, um, not where I was, but very close. So it seemed like that'd be a more logical place to keep bees. But of course, I have to come to the most densely populated state in the country to start. And um, so when I, when I go to this meeting, I was shocked that the room was filled and that there were so many other people that were as interested in the honey loving bug as me. Um, and the thing that struck me the most was that there was a bee club that met in my area. And what surprised me is like that there were so many other people keeping bees that they could sustain a club because I had no idea and keep it going from month to month. So I, I ended up joining the club. Um, at that time, the Northeast had uh, our monthly meetings had anywhere from nine to 12 people. And we met in this uh, dingy room. Uh, <laughs> it was like an annex building. And it seemed like most of them were uh, grumpy old men. And I sort of joke about it in the book that I think that the average age was about 400 and that the, the meetings just were kind of disorganized. And, and as a new beekeeper, I didn't really find them that helpful. And so it was the Cub Scout sleepover that changed everything for me. And it's funny, like when I was a kid with scouts, sleep, you know, going on a camp out meant going outside, but apparently now that's a little too complicated. So at least uh, for my son's pack, that camping meant going inside to the aquarium in uh, Connecticut. And um, this was uh, from my post from when, uh, when we did it because you had to sleep in your sleeping bags on a cement floor and uh, you were assigned a room and ours was mammals of the sea. So my son and I slept behind the, an otter exhibit. And uh, as I'm laying there on the cement floor, there was no way I was gonna sleep uh, between my back spasms and just all the dust that was around. So, uh, you know, I love this meme because it's true. You know, I don't always talk about bees because sometimes I'm asleep, but since I wasn't sleeping, I started thinking about the bee club and how I can make it better. And um, so in my head, I pictured like a, a Microsoft Word template. And yeah, that's pretty odd, but that's how my brain sometimes works. And then I put all the months in it in my head and then what, how I would line up the different talks by every month. And then from having been at a few state meetings at this point, have met other uh, beekeepers in our area, um, like Landy, and Bob Hughes, uh, Tim Schuler, just to name a few, who I thought would be great speakers. So when I got back from the camp out, I emailed all these folks and asked if they could do it. And then I bring this calendar of events, which no one asked me to do, <laughs> and I didn't have permission to do, but I brought it to the meeting to see what the reaction would be. And everyone loved it, so I got elected president. And so the moral of this story really is that if you wanna be an officer in NJBA, my advice is go sleep on a cement floor. And as the president of the club, I really wanted to grow it from that nine to 12 people that were meeting monthly, um, you know, because I've seen other clubs, at, at, you know, especially when I would go to the state meeting and see how big like South Jersey was at that point. I mean, just huge. And, um, you know, here we were a dozen folks. So, you know, we needed members and we needed money. And at the same time that I was elected, um, so was uh, Rich Schluger. He was elected as the first VP and he and I did all this stuff with the Northeast together. And so one of the things that we started doing was bee talks because it was a great way to raise money for the club and also create awareness uh, for local beekeeping. And up here in North Jersey, you know, there's, you know, 70 odd municipalities just in the Bergen County area. And then in all those municipalities, they have rotary clubs, garden clubs, schools, and you name it. So there was a lot of uh, um, requests for talks. And, um, and each time I did a talk, 
it actually, I, I would like if I came back, if there was a question asked that I didn't know uh, how to answer it, or um, I thought of a better way how to say it, that that kept refining how I was talking. And so each time my, I did a talk, it got a little bit better. And so my explanations got cleaner and cleaner. Um, and then also because I'd have kept having to look stuff up, my B knowledge really increased. And, and so that's why I really um, continue to do bee talks and tell other beekeepers that you really should. It'll make you a better beekeeper. Just getting in front of the public and having to explain things is a great way for you to assimilate that information and um, just cement in what you're supposed to do. So this went on for years. And um, literally after 125 talks, as I added it up of how many I had done through the years, I said, man, why am I doing this? And how can I keep saying the same thing time and time again? And why is it that the people that walk up always ask the same questions? And I also said to myself, but you know, people laugh at my goofy bee jokes. They like how I explain things. So maybe that there's a little bit more that I could be doing. And you know, the old beekeeping joke, which I think is true. You ask three beekeepers a question, you're gonna get four answers. And what was happening too was that's when you know there was a lot of uh, bee videos on YouTube and um, during our meetings there just seemed to be all these differing opinions and and it kept coming up that people who had watched things on YouTube then uh, felt like it was just opinion versus opinion as opposed to opinion versus fact. So for me, um, I always try to base how I do things on science. And um, but I, so I felt like I needed to do more to, to kind of show that I was talking about. And so what it was, was I, I realized I needed the Cornell Master Beekeeping Program. And I can tell you the day I signed up because it was February 8th, 2017. And I know it because that's the day my daughter was born, that I was literally in the hospital with my wife who was in early labor. And uh, and she was kind of euphoric from, you know, thinking our child's going to be here soon. And uh and I said, hey, you know, you know, because as a beekeeper, it doesn't matter when you talk about bees, uh, even in the delivery room. And I'm like, hey, you know, that Cornell course opens up today. <laughs> and uh, so I think that because she was so happy, she's like, yeah, sign up. So I was literally in the hospital room when I signed up uh, for the program. And uh, if we have <clears throat> to our other master beekeepers on the call, I do apologize that I'm going to I'm going to spill the beans and tell everybody what the true test of a master beekeeper is. Being able to drink your coffee through your veil and not spill a drop. But seriously, the Cornell program is four separate courses over 15 months. And each course, um, you, at the end of it, you have a project that you have to complete as it, it, to show that you, you've assimilated all that material. So the project at the end of the first course was you had to write an outline for how do you give a speech to non beekeepers. And I was like, holy cow, I've, <laughs> I've done over 125 of these. I know exactly what to do. So I wrote it down real fast and bam, it just like, it really struck me how easy it was to do that. And um, the, the person who runs the Cornell program, Emma Walters uh, was so, um, gave me a lot of positive feedback and just said how great it was. And that assignment at Cornell was really a light bulb for me. And that was a changing point for what I decided to do. And I, I took that outline that I had written for Cornell and I turned it into an article about how do you give a bee talk for bee culture. So I sent it in and Kim Flottam wrote back and said, there's a lot of good information in here. So he published it. And I was so excited and thrilled that Kim Flottam wrote me back um, that I wrote two more articles and I sent them in and those were published. So I went from never submitting anything for publication to getting three articles published in less than a year. And so that really led to me writing other, other articles. And what, what I really enjoyed was that people were telling me how much they liked it, how I wrote, um, that they found it informative and funny. And that's, if there's a theme to my entire life, my soul, it's be funny and informative. And um, so I decided I would write my biggest and best story and, and started to do be people and the bugs they love. And if I was going to sum up this book in just a few sentences, it's my journey from starting right before I went into the hives through to the present and just all the things that I experienced 
uh, along the way. And here's what uh, some people who were able to review the manuscript had said. Tom Seeley, um, I, I was um, lucky enough to have him review it. And he said, if the world of beekeepers has a top ambassador, it's Frank the Bee Man Mortimer. It's a delightful portrayal for non-beekeepers, what it's like for those of us that are always thinking about bees. And the New York Times reviewed it this past summer, and they said it's an achievement to convey so much knowledge so accessibly without once seeming overbearing. And Mortimer intersperses useful facts about his passion in the successful and funny book that is sure to swell the ranks of the world's beekeepers. And the San Francisco Book Review, the reviewer said, this ranks among the best written books I've ever reviewed. It includes great humor and uses allegory that reveals tremendous background knowledge. Bee people are weird and fascinating, and the author delves deeply enough into their eccentricities to make it a fascinating read. And then Kim Flottam, um, I'm just going to read you at the end where he says, um, and be nerd alert, you'll meet some of the best people in the world, beekeepers. And what I like that he used be nerd alert in his quote is that throughout my book, um, I have these little boxed up areas that I call be nerd alerts that goes deeper into the information. So for those that just want to skim the story, they don't have to do it. But then for those of us that want a little bit deeper information, you can read the Bee Nerd Alerts. And Tammy Potter Horn, who, if you haven't read her book, Bees in America, get it. I, I love this book because it's all about um, how honeybees shaped our country from the time the European colonists brought them over to the present. And um, what I like here, she says, Mortimer has conjured the eccentric beekeepers from every corner of the world, including yours. And then Harlan Coben, for those that are a fan, he's not a beekeeper, but he's a New York Times bestselling author. Um, he currently has the number one book in fiction on the New York Times book list right now, Win. And uh, what I love most about his quote is that he uses bee puns and dad jokes. Um, and it's, he says, it's the bee's knees and getting a ton of buzz be smart and read this unbelievably interesting look at the quirky world of beekeeping. So, you know, right now, some of you might be thinking, well, what makes your book so special? And I want to be clear, it's not a how-to book, it's a laugh at my mistakes book. So I'm going to quickly read to you one of my favorite mistakes that I like to tell the story. Most of my, mon most of my monumental mistakes usually begin with me saying, let me just do this real fast. Whenever I think I'll just move at a faster speed or that I'll get something done zippity quick is when the bees remind me why it's always a better idea for me to take my time and never ever rush. The first time my soon to be wife experienced her first bee sting was when I said, I need to feed one of my hives some sugar syrup. I'll be quick. Let me do this real fast. Then because I was focused on working fast instead of watching what I was doing, I made a series of mistakes that led to my Surprised that she still married me, soon to be wife, getting stung on her right thigh. I was going to be moving fast, and so I thought I'd skip lighting the smoker, which led to alarm pheromones getting released and putting the bees on high alert. Next, I haphazardly laid the inner cover, which was covered in a fair number of bees against the side of the hive. And when I went to pour the syrup into the hive top feeder, I bumped into the inner cover, causing it to topple over and land on my never screamed, but couldn't believe what I had done, surprised that she still married me, soon to be wife's feet. Once the inner cover hit the ground, the bees became airborne, and the one that landed on my bride's thigh decided that she'd had enough. Thankfully, once my so much smarter than me, never screamed, but couldn't believe what I had done, surprised that she still married me, soon to be wife, realized that she had been stung, she immediately walked away from the hives and went back to the car and waited until I was done. Now, whenever she accompanies me to the hives, the first thing she says is, did you like your smoker? And that's what I, I like about, you know, I wanted to do was to focus on the people, those of us that choose willingly to hang around with stinging insects. You know, and, and part of my inspiration too was how many times have you been at a bee meeting and, um, or just hanging out with some bee friends and you're swapping funny stories and then someone says, man, we should put this in a book. That would make a great book. And so that's what my book is. It's a collection of all those funny stories of things that have happened to us or things that we've heard about. And, and as I've been talking to different people all these years, you know, the question comes up, why are there so many characters in beekeeping? 
and you know, I think again, if if what we're choosing to do as our our hobby or our passion or our job, it you know, it, it takes an individual thought because most people don't run towards stinging insects, especially a big ball of them. And you know, in more common terms, I think what it is is you know we're weird and we have to embrace that. And uh, you know, how else can you explain to what we do? But uh, now I'm going to read for you about um, another chapter, part of a chapter about a bee meeting, which talks about the different types of characters in beekeeping. I soon learned that another great reference was the State Beekeepers Association quarterly newsletter. There were articles from the association's president and Tim Schuler, the New Jersey State Apiarist, as well as feature stories about honeybees or beekeepers. Probably the most important listing in the newsletter was the information about the upcoming state beekeeping meeting. As soon as I saw it, I went, I sent in my registration and a check for $25. The meeting was being held about two hours away, closer to the Philadelphia suburbs than to New York. Even though the state of New Jersey may not be the geographically biggest state, it is quite diverse and it can be divided into four mindsets. New York suburbs, Philadelphia suburbs, farmland, and down the shore, which is anywhere on the Jersey's 100 plus miles of beach. If you're not from Jersey, most of your information about it has probably come from one of the reality TV shows that was filmed within its borders, which captures some local stereotypes, but is far from what it's really like to live here. What surprises most people about New Jersey is that it really is the garden state, as it has 9,000 farms covering 720,000 acres, and its biggest crops are blueberries, cranberries, and tomatoes. New Jersey has everything from a pygmy pine forest to the Appalachian Trail to the second largest waterfall east of the Mississippi. And no matter where they live, most New Jerseyans love all the na natural settings their state has to offer. I arrived at the meeting bright and early, so I'd be in line for the 7.30 a.m. check-in. The meeting was being held at Rutgers University's Eco Complex, which is on a Rutgers satellite campus in Bordertown, New Jersey, and focuses on the environment and agriculture. Everyone that I met was super friendly, and it was easy to see that most of these people had known one another for years. I didn't see anyone from our club, so I grabbed a coffee and a bagel and just walked around the atrium before heading into the meeting room. Within 30 minutes, the auditorium was full and every one of the 150 seats was taken. I was amazed to think that all these people had woken up at the crack of dawn on a Saturday morning just to listen to someone talk about bees. I had found my tribe. I looked around the room and thought of the children's book, Go Dog Go, only instead of big dogs, little dogs, red dogs, blue dogs, and all the dogs at the dog party, this was tall beekeepers, short beekeepers, male beekeepers, female beekeepers, fat beekeepers, skinny beekeepers, old beekeepers, young beekeepers, all at the bee me team. There were just as many women as men and just as many couples as singles. The more I scanned the room, the more I realized that there was not one type of person who keeps bees. Beekeepers come in all sizes, shapes, genders, colors, and ages. The only thing anyone seems to have in common was that they kept bees. And I think that that's really important. You know, it's that of how many different people there are and from different backgrounds and how we all come together. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the things that I enjoy when I'm at a meeting and you see people that maybe if they didn't keep bees, they wouldn't necessarily be friendly, but because of bees, they're able to, to, to be friends and to do things together. You know, but I think, you know, the more I've traveled, the more I realize that there are certain types of characters in beekeeping and every club has one of these. And when I go through them, you're going to recognize at least one of them. And the best thing is that these people have no idea that they're a type. So the first one is the spaceman. This is the beekeeper that loves to play dress up. When they were kids, they probably had all sorts of costumes, but they're the ones that they wear the full bee suit. They duct tape their gloves to their suit. They duct tape their pants to their shoes. They wanna make sure they're protected from head to toe before they head outside. So they're hundred percent safe from bees, plutonium and zero gravity. <clears throat> then there's the show off. This is the beekeeper that loves to perform for a crowd. When you listen to this beekeeper talk, all they talk about is the shock value and, and we'll end up talking more about the stings and how scary it is than about the bees themselves. Then there's the new age know-it-all. This is the dude who wants to forget science because he knows better. He's going to manage his bees with good vibes, unicorn, and feng shui. 
He had, does a mind meld with the bugs because he truly understands them and what the bees really need. But my favorite is this guy. This is Michael Smith, Dr. Michael Smith, who was one of Tom Seeley's uh, grad students. And if you're not familiar with his study, um, he actually did a research study to find out where on your body it hurts the most to get stung. So he stung himself three different, on three different occasions on 25 different locations on his body and all over his body, to be clear. And I mean, like in his privates, he stung himself. And uh, just for the name of science, to figure out where uh, it would hurt the most. And for those that don't know, out of all the places that he stung, what hurt the most by a long shot was his inside of his nose. And he did it three times. But to do that as a beekeeper shows that our normal is different than other people's normal. And that's why it's important to embrace it. Um, so I'd like to show, read a section here about when I first got my bees to show how, uh, how I viewed it versus a non-beekeeper viewed it. Instead of being part of installing my first hive in my backyard, my official start to beekeeping came via a series of text messages from Sarah, my son's babysitter. Days before when I told Sarah that I was going to become a beekeeper and start keeping bees in the backyard, I got the look. Something I would see from time and time again when I told somebody about my hobby. The look is the facial expression that regardless of one's native language is understood to mean, are you effing kidding me? Could, could people please mute themselves? The look is a facial expression that regardless of one's native language is understood to mean, are you effing kidding me? Sarah was overly dramatic about everything from breakfast foods to coordinating her outfit with my son's crayon selections. So my news about getting bees really sent her over the edge. As I sat on the train somewhere outside of Secaucus, the text from Sarah went something like this. There's a bright yellow car in the driveway and two strange men in the backyard. Oh, those must be the guys from the bee club bringing me my bees. Eek, are all the windows closed? Can bees fly down the chimney? Ack, what should I do? Relax, you have nothing to worry about. Nothing bad is going to happen. Now there's a huge cloud of smoke in the backyard. They're burning down the yard. No, they lit their smoker. You use smoke to keep bees calm. Hmm, what kind of smoke makes bees mellow? What are they burning? Probably pine needles. Oh, now they're carrying a box with a shiny silver top through the backyard. The fat guy's yelling at the old guy saying he's using too much smoke. The old guy's telling him to relax and he's puffing even more smoke at him. The old guy just pulled the screen off the box and he's puffing even more smoke. The fat guy is dancing around, slapping himself. He's yelling about waiting till he wasn't standing in front of the hive. Now the fat guy's running around the backyard screaming, I'm hit, I'm hit, got my ear, got my ear. The old guy is laughing. Now they are both leaving the backyard. They're ringing the front doorbell. They told me to tell you the beehives in and that they're leaving. I can see the stinger hanging from the fat guy's ear. Ew. And about the same time that Sarah was hyperventilating, hyperventilating on the living room floor, I received a single text message. Bees are in the backyard. It was a piece of cake and everything went smoothly. At last, I had a hive in my backyard and it made me smile. It was something I wanted for so long. And now I could finally call myself a beekeeper. And Again, that's why I say that our normal is different than other people's normal. And I think that's especially true when you catch swarms. Um, you know, and I think it's important when you catch swarms that you do it uh, without any gear on to show people how calm bees can be. And uh, these are photos from different times I've caught them in my downtown. And um, I always make sure to wear my, my club shirt so they know about uh, New Jersey beekeepers. And, uh, but it's funny then down below the photos, is uh, for the uh, Ridgewood mom and dad site. The, some people saw it and took pictures and were commenting on it. And the one guy's like, that dude's crazy. He throws them in his car like it's nothing. So I replied back to him and said, my wife would agree with you. But uh, again, I think it's, you know, as beekeepers, we have to do a service uh, and educate the community so that they know that bees are a benefit and that they're not dangerous. But what I, I like most and what I'm so proud about beekeeping is what, 
what great friends I've met throughout all my years in beekeeping. I, my best friends today are all as a result of keeping bees. Um, and I've just had some of the best times uh, with, with a lot of people on this call and a lot of people who couldn't make this call. Um, and it is funny how, uh, you know, the, there was only the first holiday when I was keeping bees that I was surprised that a beekeeper called me. Then after that, I knew any, any possible time, uh, a day or night, holiday or not holiday, I would most likely get a call from somebody. And I think too, it's what's, what's great about beekeepers is that I think that there must be in the gene that makes us want to be around these stinging insects. And if you think about it, we're taking care of an organism that won't love us back. It's not like a dog or a cat that's going to show you affection and make you feel good for taking care of it. Bees will sting you, right? So I think that we have this extra nurturing gene inside of us that makes us want to do it. Um, and that's why I think that we make good friends. And, um, and because it's not like a cat or a dog, that's why I love these two cartoons. The one on the left says, he likes to bring them indoors in the winter. And then the other one, <laughs> the, uh, the guy says to his wife, oh, but it's fine for you to grade papers. And the nurturing thing is also why it's, it's so great to do as a family. You know, my, I started beekeeping when my son was in kindergarten and soon he's going off to college. And then both my daughters, they're now six and four, but both of them held a frame of bees when they were three years old and they have no fear. And it's just so great to watch in their eyes as they get so excited about nature and, and just the, the world around them. And, you know, with beekeeping, it just, uh, through the years I've it come to define who my family is. It's what we do together. You know, non beekeepers might, you know, shoot hoops or, um, play golf or whatever, you know, but like everyone on this call, you know, what we do as a family is we bottle honey, we <laughs> put labels on lip balm and, and that's what keeps us close. And that's why I'm proud to call myself a bee people because of how much I love my bee people. So thank you uh, for listening and uh, I'll open up the floor to any questions. Well, thank you, Frank, for a uh, lightning and, and uh, entertaining presentation. And uh, again, we'll open the floor for questions. Uh, questions and uh, I don't see any specifically in the chat right now. Uh, so if somebody wants to unmute themselves and ask questions, feel free. Hey, Frank, I got a question for you. Yes. Uh, how long have you been keeping bees? I've been keeping bees uh, since what was it, like 07, 08. And how many hives do you have now? 15. Ooh. How did, how well do you handle them? Or are they a lot for you? I, I like it. I mean, you know, I think like a lot of us, uh, you know, I, <laughs> it's my passion and my addiction. So uh, I, it, I, I, 15 is about as much as I want to do, but uh, I do, I do like it and just, it's fun to be out there with them. Thank you. Oops. Hey, Frank. Hey, how are you? Uh, hey. just a quick question. I, I'm looking forward to reading the book and getting the book, uh, from start to finish from the time you said, like the light bulb went off and said, Hey, I want to, want to write a book until the distribution. What's, what's the time frame involved there, Frank? Uh, um, good question, Jeff. So it took me to write the first draft about nine months and then another two months to go through and edit it. Cause like, you know, I would write it one chapter at a time. And then, so what I had to do is read it through quickly from start to finish to make sure it all flowed together. And the funny thing was when I went through my first draft, I had talked about how skunks eat bees in three different places. And cause I'd written it, you know, over nine months, I didn't remember. But it was funny because in some places it was almost identical what I had written. And uh, so I had to take things like that out so it wasn't repeated. But that's like back to the B talks, how I had refined this different way I would explain things is what, how I put it in the book. So that's why I think it went so smoothly. But so after the, the, the draft and then the revisions, then, then I had to um, find a literary agent, which that took another uh, four to five months. And then from once I had an agent, 
then it took her about three months to get it uh, signed by a publisher. And initially the book was gonna come out this past summer. Um, so, you know, but then because of crazy that they pushed it back till March. So in the initial time frame, it would have been, I think just under two years, it would have taken from the time I started to when it was supposed to publish. Thank you. I'm going to look in the chat now. Uh, Frank, I got Frank. Let, let Charlie go. Go ahead. Yeah. Who was going to ask a question? So, Frank, I have a question for you. It's Isidore. So, in regards to your passion, do you think uh, you're more passionate for bees over time, or or is it about the same? Or is it decreased? I don't think it's decreased. But, uh, <laughs> but I was just wondering, you know, have you had your highs and lows of beekeeping? Has it been pretty steady or has it just been increasing? I was curious in terms of your experience, uh, you know, within your reading your book, I couldn't tell if, if you're more excited today or, or, or you know, it's been, it just seems like you've just been very excited about beekeeping uh, from the beginning. Yeah, I, I would say that, um, it, you know, like the, the, when you, if you remember when you first get into beekeeping and it's all new, like you're excited every time you see that they built comb or that you see pollen for the first time. So my excitement was, you know, all those firsts. And then I think it, it kind of what my passion or excitement changed. So as I learned more, you know, and they, and again, um, like the Cornell course, because it taught me a lot. So I got excited to be able to take what I learned into my beekeeping practices. So I would say, it, it, I, my passion changed to different aspects of beekeeping through the years, but it has been pretty steady. Good, thank you. Uh, Robert Jenkins has a question. He has his yeah. hand up. Hey, hey Frank, uh, as, as I've seen over the past two years as you've been writing this, you really enjoyed the process uh, I know it was difficult for you, but you you came up with a, a fantastic book, uh, which we which we my wife and I both love, of course. Uh, have you given any thought to to doing a sequel, uh, something that would go you know follow more along the lines of uh, your, your the process you're going through now? Yeah, I I would I, I have found that I really enjoy writing, so if um... If all the stars aligned, I would like to do a sequel um, because I so much of this book is my early part. And so I'd like to talk more of uh, my current um, things I've been doing. And then two, what I what I really like is um, I, I am a self-defined nerd and I love to just learn facts and especially history and stuff. So the, there's so many more things that I could twist into stories um, that I, I would be really excited to do it again. Fantastic. Look forward to it. Thanks. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> and uh, let's see, uh, somebody said, yeah, writing a, keeping B seems normal to me. Writing a book feels foreign. What are some things you learned about book writing to do this? Uh, would you be willing to do again? So what I learned with um, to write a book is that it, you have to be used to rejection. You, you'll get more rejection than you've ever gotten in your whole life of people just telling you, no, no. And then how many times you have to edit the book and read it and edit it and read it and edit it. Like once the, it was at the publisher, it was at least three times that I had to read the book within like a week each time um, to go through it, to make sure that everything was correct. So no errors got introduced and all the other ones were fixed. So it's, so I guess what I learned is that it, it's a pretty technical process to just make sure that things, uh, typos and stuff don't get into the final, final product. I have another question for you, Frank. So have, uh, have, has the family started questioning your sanity yet or, or uh, have they just, you know, basically adopted to the lifestyle that you decided to put on top of them. Yeah. Yeah. I say, I say my wife only has one flaw and that's her taste in men. Um, because it's, yeah, I mean, it, it is crazy. And I'm very lucky that, uh, that they have come along with me on this journey 
And uh, I don't know if they enjoy it as much as I do, but at least that we like to be together. Um, so uh, yeah, so I, so I am lucky. <laughs> but that I think from the beginning, my wife should have questioned my sanity. <laughs> That's funny you say that because I told my wife that's a, a, a you know a, a wife's responsibility is to keep the guy out of trouble and she refused, she failed in this particular case in, in allowing me get to get into beekeeping so all right very good Any and, other it, questions? and it is funny the last chapter of my book really goes into um, how my wife and I met and how beekeeping played a part in that and how my uh, mother-in-law is not a fan of any kind of bugs, but uh, thanks to the, the New Jersey beekeepers that I was able to win her over at least slightly. And again, that's in the last chapter. That's great. Okay. Any other questions for Frank tonight? One more? Nope. Yeah, and, and thanks everybody. Uh, I, I do appreciate everyone who, who came to this today. And um, as I say in my acknowledgements, you know, I thank everybody in the New Jersey Beekeepers Association because it's uh, because of all of you that I was able to write the book. So thank you. All right. Very good. Thanks, Frank. And uh, if there's no other questions. We'll call it a night. And thank you for uh, the presentation, Frank. All right. Take care, everybody. <laughs> bye bye.